Welcome to Pathway. We're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we want to say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID-related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Excited to be with you. Those of you here in the room, excited to be with those of you joining us online and upstairs in our venue as well. And as always, very honored to have the opportunity to be able to share today and to lead us into a new series we're beginning together. If you have a Bible with you today, uh, maybe on your mobile device or an actual Bible in your hands, we want to invite you to turn in that with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And Ephesians is in the New Testament of our Bibles. If you need to look at the table of contents and look it up and find your way there, uh, we're going to be talking about that here in just a moment. As I said, we're starting a new series together this weekend, uh, as you see on the screen, called Join God. And uh, together over the next several weeks, we're going to be walking through this and talking together about the importance of knowing and believing that God is up to something in the world. And he's doing good things in the lives of people all around us. And not only that, we're going to be talking about how he actually invites all of us to join him in that, to be a part of what he's doing in the world right alongside there and right along with him. And so uh, we're going to talk about that together. As I thought about some ways to set up the series with you a bit this weekend, I thought about an experience our family had uh, a few weeks ago at the tail end of our spring break. Many of you probably went on a spring break trip. Uh, ours got postponed from last year, of course, to this year, and so we were very excited. Uh, we did something for the first time. We spent a whole week, just the five of us, at the beach together, and we had a great week together. And, and really, th all throughout the week, we loved the beach. We enjoyed the sand and the water. The waves were pretty calm uh, until we got to the last day of our vacation there, our last day at the beach. And uh, on that day, there were a few more clouds, and there was a lot more wind, which meant we had some incredible waves that were crashing and roaring all around us. And I actually have a picture up here on the screen of a couple of our kids, our two boys, playing in those waves and trying to ride those waves. Some of you have done that before. And uh, for many people on the beach that day, the extra wind, the extra waves meant they weren't going to go into the water, right? They wanted to just kind of sit on the shore and sit on the, in the sand and watch from a distance and ooh and ah at the crashing of these bigger than normal waves. And yet for my boys and I, uh, we weren't going to sit there on the beach. I mean, these were the waves we had been waiting for all week long, and so we were excited. We spent most of the day in the water doing what you do when you're trying to ride those waves. You kind of sit and wait patiently. You watch. You wait for another wave to come in, and then you try to time your jump, whether you have a body board or just your big chubby body like me, and you try to ride those waves and go along for the adventure, right? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You've done that or tried that before. And uh, we had a great time that day doing that. And I share that image, that picture, that kind of moment with you this morning as we begin this series together because I think it's a great reflection, really, of what God is up to and doing in our world and also a great reflection of what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks 
together. Because here's what we believe about God. Despite all of the chaos and confusion and conflict and challenges that we see around us and that we face in our world, we believe that right there in the midst of all of that, and sometimes even just like in, in, in light of all of that, God is still on the move. He's still doing great work. And in some ways, we believe God is actually kind of blowing some fresh wind across the water and creating some new waves of his kind of mission and purposes in the world. And part of the invitation, as I said, that we want to throw out to all of us, and I think God throws out to all of us with that, is this, that he's inviting us to kind of get into the water with him and to ride the waves of what he's doing in the world all around us. Uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to talk a lot about how to do that, kind of to carry that metaphor, how to recognize the waves and to jump in them and to join in at the right time and all of that. But before we get into how over the next several weeks, what I want to do with you today is I want to spend kind of a few minutes talking about the importance of us getting off the beach. And not only recognizing that God is doing things in the world, but refusing to kind of sit from a distance and ooh and ah from a distance at what God is doing and instead choose to kind of brave the waters, to step into the waters with him so that we can join in with what God is doing in our world. And to talk a little bit about that with you today, what I want to do is walk through uh, what I'm just calling four kind of foundational convictions. A lot of times we have a big idea here at Pathway. I don't have a big idea for you today. I have four big ideas. And so I want to walk through those with you. And I think these are all very important for us uh, to know, to be reminded of, to think about as we begin a series of conversations together like this. So I want to walk you through these. When you came in today, you were handed some teaching notes. I encourage you to take those out. You can Write down whatever's helpful for you there. If you're watching online or upstairs in the venue, you should have a copy of those in the venue, or you can follow along right there online. And I want to walk you through these four foundational convictions. And the first one that I want to point out for you and talk about with you today is this, that, that we believe that God is on a mission to rescue and restore his good but broken creation. Now, I know a lot of you already know this, a lot of you already believe this, and yet I think it's so important for us to come back to this over and over again, to remind ourselves of this as the essence of what God is doing and what we're a part of when, we're, when we belong to him, when we are his people in the world. But obviously, there's a lot of ways the Bible talks about this. If we would look through the Bible, there's a lot of descriptions of God's mission to rescue and restore his good but broken creation. But I want to draw your attention today to one that... Uh, that God has been using to kind of challenge and convict me in a fresh way lately that uh, is found in Ephesians chapter 1, as I mentioned to you a moment ago. So again, I want to read for you from there. And, and uh, Ephesians was a letter that we have in our Bibles, one of the books of our Bible, and uh, was written by an early church leader, an early church missionary, a guy by the name of Paul 2,000 years ago, to a church that he helped start in the ancient city of Ephesus. And after he left this church, he wrote this letter to them to encourage them and coach them as followers of Jesus. And it's just loaded with all sorts of practical, helpful things. In fact, some people believe that it's a unique book in the Bible, that in some ways it serves as kind of a handbook for us of what it means to be the church and what we're called to be about and what we're called to do together. And so I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. The first chapter is loaded with all sorts of things I wish we could talk about together today, but what I want to do is I want to just kind of draw your attention to the last two verses of chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Here, Paul, he's done a lot of different things in introducing this letter. When he gets to this point, he gives this kind of incredible description of Jesus. And with that, he gives also a description of us as Christ followers, as the church, who we are and what we're supposed to be. And I think all of it kind of gives this arrow that points us in the direction of the mission of God and what he's doing in the world and what he's inviting us to be a part of with him. So let me read this for you, these words. Again, if you have a Bible, you can read along or underline or make some notes there, or you can just follow along up here on the screen with me. But here's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. He says, and God placed all things under his feet. The his there is a reference to Jesus. God has placed everything under the feet of Jesus. In other words, Jesus has been made king over everything, over all of creation. And this is, in fact, the way it was always supposed to be. It was supposed to be this way all along from the very beginning. And yet we as human beings, 
We made a mess of it. We said we're not going to live with Jesus over all. We're not going to live with him as king of our lives and of all of creation. We're going to do things our own way and call our own shots. And, and yet God never gave up on his original design, his original dream for us and for all of creation, for him in the person of Jesus to be king over all. And so God has placed all things, part of his mission in the world is reestablishing Jesus as king and his kingdom uh, here and now in this life and in this world all around us. He's placed all things under his feet. And not only that, Paul says that God has also appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church. He says that the church is like a body. We're Jesus' body and And so like a physical, literal body, we're all parts. When we belong to Jesus, when we give our lives to him, we put our trust in him, we become parts of this body. And Jesus is a part as well. He's an important part. Paul tells us here he is what part? He is the head of the body over everything for the church. He says that the church is not only his body, but it's the fullness of him, the fullness of Jesus who does what? Who fills everything. In every way. And these are just a few words, but these are powerful, profound, defining words. Not only describing Jesus, but describing us and pointing us to the mission of God in the world. Again, described a lot of different ways in the Bible, but but God has been challenging me and convicting me lately with these words, particularly these last words here that I think capture in such a Uh, an illustrative way, what it is God is doing in the world. Having put all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him head over his church, his body, God is filling everything in every way with Jesus. You see, the mission of God restoring and rescuing his good but broken creation isn't just about changing what happens when people die. It, is, it does include that, and that is a part of that, of course, a very important part. But it's not the whole story. It's not the full extent of it. God is up to so much more than that. In fact, rather than just being about taking us to heaven, God is in the, in the, in the business right now. His mission right now in our lives today is about bringing heaven into earth, here on earth again, and and integrating and transforming things on earth so that as it is in heaven, it would be here on earth. And he's setting out to do that by filling every space and every place, every relationship, every home, every marriage, every workplace, every school and classroom, every neighborhood, every kind of nook and cranny of our culture and our society, every broken space, every broken area of our lives or the lives of people around us, everything in every way with Jesus, with the goodness of Jesus and the love and grace and truth of Jesus, with the good news of Jesus, the mercy, the kindness, the justice of Jesus, the transforming, healing, restoring work of Jesus, everything, in every way, with him. This is the mission that God is carrying out and has been carrying out since the very beginning. And you know what God's strategy is in our day and our lives and the world around us today for accomplishing that and for doing that in our world? Strangely enough, it's you and me. God's plan for filling everything in every way with Jesus is using you and me in the places we find ourselves in our everyday lives to do that. Again, Paul describes us here as his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Like like his literal physical body, we are his spiritual body, his hands and feet, his presence in the world. And the mission we're invited into is to fill everything through our lives in every way. With Jesus. Now, this leads to the second conviction I want to point out for you then today, which is this if God is going to use us in that way and is inviting us to be a part of what He's doing in His world and rescuing and restoring His good but broken creation, the second thing that we need to come to terms with, and I hope you leave later on today believing, is this that the central identity and responsibility of every follower of Jesus is to be a loving missionary that fills the world with him. 
Again, this is at the heart. This is the essence of what God has created us as a called out people, as the church, as a community of followers of Jesus. This is at the center of what it means for us to be that and to do that. This is the central identity and the central responsibility that we have and that we should be helping each other live out together, being loving missionaries who fill everything in every way with Jesus. You see, the church was never meant to be the kind of end result or the final destination. It wasn't the point where everything else was kind of heading or moving toward. The church was never meant to be the end destination. We were created to be the instrument or the tool that God used to accomplish his mission in the world. I heard one pastor describe it this way one time. He said, it's not so much that the the church has been given a mission, but rather that the mission has been given a church. That what God is doing in the world, there's this group of people that have been given to that mission. You and me, whoever of us consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus, this is what we're invited to do. It's the essence, the center of our identity and our responsibility as followers of Jesus. And that being the case, I think it's actually, it becomes this kind of great filter, this great kind of tool we can use to actually evaluate ourselves at times. And I want to kind of wade into this as just gently and lovingly and just kind of shepherd this as well as I can and kind of point the arrow at myself as much as anyone else. But I think when we realize this and we believe this, it's a great opportunity for us to step back at times and really evaluate how much we are really following after Jesus. If this is what defines us, if this is the thing that is core to who we are and what we're called to do and to be, then I think it's good for us every once in a while to step back and ask ourselves, man, if we're, if we're never getting into the water, if we're only watching from the beach what God is doing in the world and cheering on from a distance, but we're never braving the water and trying to ride some of the waves right there alongside of him ourselves, if we're never actually getting into the water and joining in with God and the work that he's doing in our world, I think we ought to step back from time to time and just kind of pay attention to that and take note of that and grapple in light of that with whether or not we're actually following Jesus as much as we think we are or claim to be. When I thought about this, it reminded me of a video game my kids have been playing for the last year or so, a game called Among Us. And uh, it's a space-themed game they love to play. And basically, anyone that's playing, most of the people are, are called what's referred to as crewmates. And, uh, and then amongst the crewmates, there's always at least one person that's designated as an imposter. And uh, the imposter looks like everybody else in the game, but their job is to go and try to take out all the crewmates before they realize they're the imposter. And the imposter, or the crewmate's job is to figure out who that imposter is before they take them all out. And uh, I asked my kids one time, I said, so how do you, like, how do you figure out who the imposter is? And, and one of my boys said to me, well, Dad, you have to look for clues. You have to kind of look how people, like where they go and what they do and how they interact with other people. And, and as soon as he said that, I thought, man, that's actually a pretty good way to evaluate ourselves as well at times as to how closely we are actually following after Jesus. We have to step back sometimes and look at our own lives and see kind of where we go and how we move and what we do and how we interact with others. Because if we're never wading into the water, if we're never joining God as loving missionaries seeking to fill everything in every way with Jesus, we may, I mean, I don't want this to sound as harsh as it sounds, but just speaking to myself as much as to any of you, we may be imposturing ourselves a bit with regard to how much we actually are following after this Jesus we love and claim to follow. You see, this is central to what it means to follow him. I heard another pastor one time put it this way. He said, you either are a missionary or you need a missionary. It's a pretty good way to put it. Because this is the essence of who we are. Every follower of Jesus, the central identity and responsibility is to join Jesus as loving missionaries who fill the world with him. And this is why we're going to talk about it this summer as we walk into the summer together. This is why we want to grow into this and get better at this together as individuals and as a church community. And, 
And some of you may hear that and you're thinking, okay, all right, Tyler, you've got me convicted and I, I'm thinking about this and I want to do this, but I'm not sure that's really, I'm not sure I'm, I'm like missionary material here. I've seen missionaries or you guys have had them share at church in a service and I'm not really that, I mean, do you know who I am and the way that I talk and things that I do? I'm not sure that that's really me. And what I want to do then is try to assure you today that it can be and it should be. And I want to talk to you then about this third conviction that I think is so important for us. That while it may be overwhelming, that while it may seem intimidating, we actually can all do this. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. In fact, we believe it can be as simple as us following some simple missionary rhythms that actually Jesus, our leader, our Lord, modeled for us. Again, I know a lot of you may hear this idea of being a missionary and it's intimidating. Or maybe it's not only I don't think I can do that. For some of us, maybe it's like, I'm not sure I really want to do that. Because you have all these images and ideas that come to mind of what being a missionary is or what it looks like or what it's all about. Maybe for some of you, when you think of the idea of being a missionary, you, you picture or imagine something like this that we see up on the screen, right? And you think, well, do I have to go onto street corners with these kind of like loud and bold signs and megaphones and tell people to repent and turn to Jesus? Is that what you mean? And I just want to assure you today that for most of us, most of the time, that's usually not the way it works. And it's most of the time, probably not the way it should work for many of us. But maybe for others, you don't imagine something like that. Maybe you imagine something more like this, where you think of some other religions that will send out missionaries kind of door to door. They knock on your door. They want to visit at your kitchen table, share with you their beliefs and try to get you to believe those same things. And maybe some of you are like, I don't, I never really appreciated that or connected with that. Is that what you're talking about? And I just want to assure you that's usually for most of us, most of the time, that's not the way it works. And most of the time, it's not the way it really should work for us. Maybe others of you have had experiences like this, where you go into a restroom and you're doing your thing and like, and somebody's like left some literature at the most disgusting of places to leave something for somebody. And, uh, and in that little pamphlet is like everything you're supposed to know about your life and how to be saved and what to do to make your life right with God. And I'm not saying God never works through that or hasn't or won't or may not use you to do something like that. But for most of us, most of the time, that's usually not the way it works. And, and most of the time probably shouldn't either. You see, we actually believe that it's much more basic and simple and regular and normal than that. And so that's why we want to talk about some of these missionary rhythms that Jesus actually modeled for us that we believe all of us can do in the context of our everyday lives. At Pathway, we've talked about these actually for several years now, and we begin to summarize them and remember them through a word, an acronym, just the word BLESS. And you see them in your notes, you see them up here on the screen. Again, we're going to unpack these more over the next several weeks, things that we can do in everyday life to follow Jesus' example and lead to join him in what he's doing in, a, in the world. The B stands for beginning with prayer, which we'll talk about next week, which again, going back to the wave analogy, this is one of the ways that we kind of we, we pray that God would make us willing. He'd open up our hearts and our hands to join him in the water. God, help us to join you in what you're doing in the world. And not only that, to pray for others around us, that God would open up their hearts and lives to the waves of the work that he wants to do in them. The L stands for listen. And this is one of the ways that we love people by, by actually caring enough to get to know them, to listen with curiosity, to get to know their stories, to hear where they're at and what they're going through. And and in that, it's one of the ways we kind of recognize the waves of what God might be doing in their life that we can jump in and join with. The E is for eat together. And it's just this idea of spending unrushed time with people, welcoming them into our lives and, and being willing to join them in their lives. And many times as we do these things, we, we also then discover needs that they have, ways that we can serve, ways that we can come alongside them. Again, it's recognizing, it's seeing the waves of what God might be doing or is already doing in their lives and trying to jump in with those with him. And of course, in the second S, that often these things can open the door for as well as opportunities to share God's story, to talk about who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what he's done for them and the ways that God's story has rearranged your story and how God's story can bring new life into their stories as well. Again, these are things that all of us can do, that Jesus modeled for us. And we're going to lean in and try to grow into these things as we walk into the summer together to get better at this. We believe all of us can do this. 
by engaging in some of these simple things that we see Jesus do that we can incorporate into our lives as well. So that's the third conviction I wanted to mention to you. And the fourth and final one is this. I think it's actually the most important for us, actually at this stage of the conversation. We talked about how God is on a mission to rescue and restore his good but broken creation by filling everything in every way with Jesus. He wants to use us for that as missionaries, loving missionaries in the world who fill the world with him. It doesn't have to be rocket science, but can be these simple practices that we see in the life of Jesus that we live out as well. And yet before we dive into all of that, the place that I think all of us individually and even us as a church community together have to come back to and begin with is this. We have to begin by resolving that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is in fact King. That Jesus is in fact what Paul described him to be in Ephesians 1. That God has put everything under his feet and he in fact is the head over us as his body. And here's what I mean by that. And here's why I think that's so important. How many of you ever had situations in your life where you knew what to do? Like you knew the right thing to do and you also knew how to do the right thing. But if you were 100% honest, you didn't really want to do it. And so you just didn't do it. Any of you ever been there in your life? And I have a lot of examples. One example that gets me every time is Nutella. I know that I shouldn't eat Nutella. I know what to do. I know that the easiest way how to do that is to not ask Natalie to get some at the store. And yet, I don't really want to give up Nutella. And so I keep eating Nutella. And it's not very good for me. But uh, we see that in a lot of different areas of life where there's things we know what to do. We know how to do it. But unless we want to do it, we probably never will. And while that's true in so many areas of life, I think it's especially and always true when it comes to joining Jesus in the mission of what he's doing in our world. Again, we're going to talk a lot through this series about how to do that, but if we try to jump into how without first resolving this, resolving, concluding, affirming, and embracing that Jesus is Lord I'll be honest about myself, and probably true for most of you, we're probably not going to get very far. And at best, you might come and sit and listen to some talks from some of us, but it probably won't do anything much different than maybe what we've done in the past, unless we begin here with this. I know in my own life, in different kind of times and situations and seasons, if Jesus is not Lord over certain areas of my life, all of a sudden I allow other things, other people, other priorities, other ambitions, myself to just take his proper place in my life. Whenever that happens, I start to kind of uh, embrace in my life, to use a little bit of a religious term with you, these things called like, like idols in my heart that become false lords, so to speak, that begin to control and dictate and direct what I do with my life and how I spend my time. And many times it's uh, just simple idols we don't even often think of, but idols like an idol of comfort or an idol of our own ease or an idol of our own selfish preferences. We think about the pandemic over the last year, and, and actually I think the last year has kind of made it even easier for us to let some of these idols kind of consume us and take over our lives. If you think about it last year, I mean, obviously we we're all disappointed about so many of the things that we couldn't do anymore, but it also gave us, particularly for the introverts in the room, right, a lot of freedom to not have to do a bunch of things we didn't really want to do anymore. And if we're not careful, it can condition us to begin to live our lives that way as though, you know what, I, it's kind of nice to only do what I want to do. I don't really want to do anything that I don't have to do or don't want to do. You see, what I found in my life is that anytime Jesus is not Lord, I don't have enough time to begin with prayer. Honestly, I don't love enough to listen. As an introvert, I don't care enough to open up my life. I don't want to open up my home and my schedule and my kitchen table or my living room to other people. And I certainly don't want to be inconvenienced by having to serve them and meet some need that they have. And I don't want to be made uncomfortable by trying to share God's story with somebody else. And, and yet, if Jesus is Lord, if he really is king in my life, and I truly believe that he is king over all creation, that everything has been placed 
under his feet. If I truly believe that he loved me enough to give all of himself for me and for you and for the whole world and, and now invites me to lovingly give all of my life back to him, if I truly believe that he and only he is worthy of it all for my life, if I truly believe that his way is the best way for me and for you and for our world, if I'm truly being transformed by his loving leadership and lordship in my life, well, then I don't think I'll be able to help but to run into the water to watch for the waves and join in with whatever he, my Lord, our Lord, is doing. I think it has to begin there. It began there for our ancestors in the faith 2,000 years ago in the early church. I mentioned to you earlier Paul who wrote what we read from Ephesians. Paul, again, declared Jesus as Lord there when he said that God put everything under his feet. He made him head over everything for the church. But then uh, in another letter that Paul wrote in the book of Philippians to the Philippian church that he helped start as well, uh, he kind of unpacks what that looked like for him personally even more. And as we think about this idea of resolving that Jesus is Lord in our lives, I want to read these words from Paul for you just to kind of paint the picture of what it looks like for us to live with this posture toward him. Here's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my what? My Lord. And he goes on and he says, For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Again, Jesus was Lord for Paul. And Jesus was Lord for many others in the early church. And it was this kind of foundation that they built their lives on. And it was the foundation that their joining God in mission was carried out, was lived out in their lives and the lives of people all around us. That statement of Jesus as Lord wasn't just some intellectual belief that they agreed with. It wasn't part of some prayer they prayed one day and then moved on from. It was a, a whole new way of life. A whole new way of seeing the world and seeing God's work in the world and seeing their place in God's work in the world. It began there with that for them, and I think it has to begin there with that for us. So part of my prayer, part of my hope for us this weekend is that not only we would leave believing that God is on a mission to rescue and restore his good but broken creation, he wants to do that by filling everything in every way with Jesus, and he wants to use us, so much so that, in fact, our central identity and responsibility as followers of Jesus is to join him in that way. I hope you leave here believing that and believing that as we walk through the next several weeks, all of us can do this and get better at this together. But before we get to any of that, my hope, my first hope and prayer for all of us today is that if we're here and we are followers of Jesus, that we would take the next step of not only loving him as Savior, but also resolving that he is our Lord. That everything we have, every moment of our lives, every place and space we find ourselves, every blessing he's blessed us with is not ours, but we give it all back to him to join him in the good work of what he's doing in our world. Before we go today, we want to take a moment just to reflect on that and actually an opportunity for us to commit ourselves to that through something we do from time to time around here at Pathway called communion. And if you've been around our church or a church for a long time, perhaps you know a little bit about what communion is. Uh, it's actually something Jesus started thousands of years ago with his first disciples, the night that he was going to be arrested and crucified on his way to his death and resurrection on our, in our place and on our behalf to rescue and restore this world and as he gathered that night with his disciples, he was sharing a meal with them and he took some bread and he said, guys, I want to give some new meaning to this bread for you. He says, this bread is my body that's given for you. And so now when you eat it together in this way, I want you to eat this in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup and he said, this cup is my blood that is going to be shed and poured out for the forgiveness of sins for the world and from now on, when you drink this in this way together, I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. And since the very beginning, for thousands of years, followers of Jesus, the church together has been practicing what Jesus started with them as a way 
of remembering him. And we're going to do that here over the next few minutes. But as we do that today, I have kind of a, an extra layer to that I want to challenge you with as we eat and drink here in just a moment. I want to challenge you today to let this not only be an opportunity to remember what Jesus has done for us, but also as an opportunity for us to commit or recommit to the mission of what Jesus has invited us into with him. You see, in the same way that we celebrate that Jesus in his literal body and blood was broken and poured out for the hope and healing of our broken world, in the same way we, his spiritual body, as Paul talked about it, we too are invited in and called to be broken and poured out, given away for the sake of the hope and healing of our broken world as well. And so we want to give you a moment to reflect on that. Our team's going to lead us in this song. And uh, hopefully as you came in today, you had a chance to grab one of the, uh, the cups with the juice and the bread with that together. If you didn't get a chance yet, maybe just raise your hand. Our usher team can bring those around and make sure you have one of those. But I want to encourage you to reflect over these next few minutes to prepare your heart. And then in just a moment, when they're done with the song, I'll come back up and lead us in prayer. And uh, we will eat and drink, not only in remembrance, but as a sign of commitment together. So let's prepare our hearts for that.
all of us here, all of you upstairs in the venue and online, let's just join together in a moment of prayer as we prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, we just quiet our hearts before you. We bend our knee before you. We acknowledge you and only you as Lord. We acknowledge that through our words, but we also acknowledge it through the act of eating and drinking and remembrance of you and what you did for us on the cross and dying in our place to forgive us of sins and being raised to new life to give us new life in this life and in the life to come as well. Jesus, we know we have to come back to over and over again this truth, this reality that it's not our own lives, our own preferences. It's not our accomplishments or ambitions. It's not our possessions or our toys. It's not our politics or our agendas. It's not any of the things that our lives get so wrapped up in. It's you and only you. Jesus, you are Lord. And we thank you for what you're doing in the world, and in our lives, the lives of people around us. And we thank you for inviting us into that with you as well. And so as we pause for this moment of communion together, Jesus, we not only do this in remembrance of you, but also as a sign, as a declaration of our commitment to you and to join in with what you're doing in the world. And so Jesus, this bread that is your body given for us, we take and we eat this now in remembrance and in commitment to you. Let's eat this together. And Jesus, with this cup that is your blood that was shed and poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for the hope and healing of the world, this too we drink now, not only in remembrance, but also in commitment to you. Let's drink this together. Jesus, may we be your people in your world, part of your mission of what you've called us to do. We commit our lives to you for that. We pray by your grace that you'd help us to join you in every way, in every moment, to fill everything in every way with you. We do all of this for your glory, Jesus, the Lord of all. We pray this in your strong and awesome name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Guys, thanks for being here this weekend. Again, those of you here and online and up in the venue. Uh, As you go, let's go as missionaries into the world. Let's come back eager to grow into this over the course of this series together. If you're new around here, we want to invite you to stop by guest services, and we'd love to meet you and get to know you a bit. If you need some help with next steps in your relationship with Jesus, we encourage you to stop by next steps on your way out as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you later. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the give button on the web or the app or text the word give. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.